Okay, and now for our last speaker of the day, we have a professor from West Virginia University. Please welcome Timothy Carr, everyone. Okay, uh, I'm a little out of my league here since I'm a geologist, petroleum geologist, and uh, I worked uh, 15, 16 years for a company called Arco, and then BP bought them and decided I should become an academic. And uh, uh, went to the University of Kansas and went at the University of West Virginia. So I've worked a lot of these things, and I do have some production out in Wyoming. Unfortunately, it doesn't pay me any money to mount the little beans. Uh, but uh, there's, it's a revolution. You've heard this, so steal the Beatles title here and shale gas and shale oil and uh, a couple operations in uh, West Virginia. Uh, you can see the drilling, and then on the right would be the uh, fracture stimulation operation. And I had to put a rock shot in here, my favorite place. And uh, again, I'm a geologist, so I'm going to come at it way down the hall. But uh, uh, here you can see uh, one and a half billion years of history. Uh, and I wondered how that guy got out there. I had no idea. But it's affected everything, and I think we've had a lot of this. The United States has had the largest increase in oil and gas production for the last three years, and we'll probably have it for the next three years, anywhere in the world. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, the Appalachian gas, as you've heard, is displacing gas from the Gulf Coast, the traditional movements. Uh, we're displacing uh, uh, the liquids uh, from the mid-continent, and that's caused some problems. Uh, we have insufficient infrastructure, and again, we've heard all these things again. Uh, uh, basically, we're replumbing the United States, turning things around. Uh, lots of challenges and opportunities, reduced prices. Uh, I thought I'd put in something here on, I thought I'd never talk about future price. One of the first jobs I had for ARCO was uh, doing long-term planning, and we were running with $100 a barrel oil in 1982. We were only off by about 25 years, but uh, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about future price and price arbitrage. But I think we're in a situation that gas prices just can't stay the way they are, and I don't know where they're going to go, but they're just it's it's just unstable. Uh, obviously, increased employment, business, uh, uh, significant coal gas on coal competition. My state, West Virginia, is in a bad situation. We have a product uh, in the Marcellus gas that we're producing a lot of, but the price is way down, and we have another product called coal, which people aren't buying. And so uh, that's uh, worked against the state. Uh, what saved us a little bit is we're exporting a lot of coal to Germany and Europe, which is sort of interesting. And then the, the decreased CO2 emissions from switching to gas. This is a, a map that I, uh, we're putting together, and it's actually changed. We have quite a bit more in Africa. These are shale gas basins of the world. And this is really important, is to get shale gas beyond the United States. Right now, we have an isolated market, which isn't going to be isolated. It's going to arbitrage itself. And the rest of the world is paying a lot more, and, but they have a tremendous asset here, especially in South America, especially in Europe. Uh, most of uh, uh, the Middle East, of all places, has tremendous shale gas assets, uh, Australia, and even into China. And this is a map you can get off our website, too, showing you the, the beast in the east, as I heard, the Marcellus in Utica. Uh, actually, it has all the wells in there, too. You can get into the individual wells, and I'll show you what's some of the stuff in the Marcellus. And this is a map showing those wells uh, in the Marcellus area. These are all wells, uh, vertical and horizontal, and some of the Utica wells that have just started. And you can sort of see there's two big areas of uh, high density, and, and we'll show you those in a minute. Uh, it's extremely large resource. Resource estimates go from not a lot, uh, not a not a super big number to a really big number. And it's a large area adjacent to market. We do have challenges in terrain, infrastructure. Um, it's 
sort of the societal environmental impact. People aren't used to the uh, the operations back there, and this is that public perception and tension, and really an outdated regulation and management system for the oil and gas industry. Uh, Marcellus has been producing since 1821. Uh, Fredonia, New York, a uh, gunsmith drove a, a, a gun barrel into the ground and made the first Marcellus well. And uh, uh, a lot of this research was funded out of uh, uh, USDOE, out of uh, the Morgantown lab and uh, NETL, and also the Pittsburgh lab. Uh, they funded about 50% of uh, George Mitchell's first wells, non-commercial wells. And, and then in 2003, Range Resources was drilling a deeper well. Like any good geologist, we drilled a dry hole. He looked up, uh, Bill Zagorski looked up hole and said, hey, let's try what they're doing down in the Barnett in the Marcellus. And he perfed the Marcellus in 2003, uh, essentially got going in 2005, time they did, tried some horizontals and things like that. Um, and now there's uh, 13,079 wells in my database, and that's wrong. It's more than that. I have no idea. It goes up every day. Uh, in the oil and gas industry, it used to be if you had a 1 in 10 success rate, you're a happy man. You can see there's 96 plugged wells out of 13,000 plus. Uh, and most of those were probably science wells. They were probably drilled vertical, plugged on purpose. There's 7,500 of those wells and those will be permitted, drilling, waiting for uh, 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 hydraulic stimulation and waiting to be hitched up. I got 7,500 wells in process. And it's a, a huge overhang. Uh, Utica, just getting going. There's 693 wells in my database, 554 wells in process. So you can see that uh, just ramping up. Okay. So we got all these challenges, and, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, sort of where I come at it. And I think you have these things, too. Uh, uh, we have this demographic challenge, even on a worldwide basis, going from a 5 billion population to an 8 or 10 million billion population. Supply challenge. Resources adequate. Uh, fossil fuel required. There's an emission challenge, which is uh, now into the CO2 realm. And uh, we have a technology challenge. And, and then we have to maintain this uh, uh, social license to operate, especially in terms of the fracture stimulation. And these things do take time, like you guys all talk about. Uh, it takes time to build out the oil and gas industry. And really, all of us are dealing with the basis of civilization. Without energy, there isn't any civilization. And I don't think people realize that. But here's what's happening in the rest of the world. China with a bullet, India, we're not going to be going up a whole lot. We're pretty much going to be stable. But this is the energy consumption predicted through 2040. Uh, the fact that it will be fossil fuel is the predictions. You can use anybody as you want. And I love uh, quoting James Hansen, who's sort of the godfather of uh, climate change. He uh, really doesn't like uh, uh, renewables very much, which I thought was fairly interesting comes at it from the nuclear. If you believe in the renewables, you believe in the Easter Bunny. Uh, we're going to be energy independent. There's no such thing as in energy independent, but energy self-sufficient very quickly. And actually, this is wrong, because I saw they just came up with new numbers. It went down faster than the line, the pre this line, where they came up with some new numbers. So. Uh, will be a net energy exporter, which is the best thing in the world that could happen to the world, is to get the U.S. off the market sucking energy from the rest of the world. Uh, tight oil, just briefly. Uh, I, M. King Hubbard predicted the uh, peak oil. It's, we're going to hit another peak. <laughs> There's no question. And uh, EIA always has a decline curve because they just don't worry about out the 2040 as much. Then whatever is going to be new, and there's plenty of new things coming on. Uh, Tuscaloosa mar uh, Marine Shale is one I'm working on that are going to be producing more oil. So we're going to have plenty of liquids. Shale gas, seen this, and uh, this is where it's at. Um, here is our production, and people often get worried about this, and it fell off my chart here, but the 
the uh, uh, orange of their production has been going up, but our reserves, and these are proved reserves, these are SEC certified book reserves, the number one way to get fired in the oil industry is to re revise your reserves downward. The number one way to get a promotion is to put them upwards. So uh, uh, usually people are pretty conservative. But you can see reserves have been going up fat at an order of magnitude f faster than production. So we're in good shape. Here's, uh, I just thought you'd see, here's what happened. There's that 2005 well up there in, uh, in Washington County, that green dot. And here's what's happened through time, 2006, seven. And these are just the horizontal wells. Happen quick. Okay, you can see there's the line, that red line's the line between the wet gas, the natural gas liquids, and the dry gas. There's also another line to the south there. That's the end of where the horizontals have been effective. There's really not a lot of horizontal Marcellus wells to the south there. Uh, the Utica would be over in Ohio, but you can see the Marcellus ends very quickly and the, you know, the wet gas tends to be a very narrow zone, and this is pretty typical of shale gas. And this is wet gas goes from ethane all the way up to least condensate, C6, so C2 to C6. And, uh, um, and that's an interesting thing, too. We're having a tremendous amount of ethane rejection. They're mixing with the gas and trying to get it to BTU down to meet specs and sending it to you guys, too. Uh, here's our production. And you can see that it ramped up. And I can't really look at it in this way, but uh, there it is. It's uh, gone up to, uh, we're up to five, uh, essentially five TCF on, on, on an annual basis. Uh, here's what, if you looked at it, Appalachian Basin, long term, 1821, gas production, 1850s, uh, uh, Drake's Well. Uh, Long-term conventional production, you can see that now 82% of the production comes out of the shale in the Appalachian Basin. What's amazing is that 82% of the production comes out of 2.5% of the wells. I always tell people the best thing that's happened to the environment is the shale gas because 2.5% of the 165,000 wells are producing most of the gas. Same thing with liquids. You can see the liquids starting to ramp up. This is the Utica. And that's even out of 0.65% of the wells. So if you look at an individual state, uh, Pennsylvania got it going first. Um, I it fell off here. This would be 0.1. Uh, in West Virginia, basically catching up. Again, these are logarithmic, so exponential. Uh, Ohio tried the Marcellus, didn't work, and then the Utica's taken off like crazy. And the Utica, in terms of liquids, same thing, is going to pass a, a, us as, like a bullet. So they're big, and, and it's interesting. Uh, many of the producers in the panhandle where we have our wet gas are thinking about drilling the Utica instead of the Marcellus as the first well to hold the, the lease because uh, some success, Utica well costs you a lot more money, but a Marcellus well will make about six million a day, a Utica well make about, the reported production's in the 30 to 40 million a day from a single well. So, okay, all these changes, decreased prices, CO2 emissions, increased employments, industrial renaissance. Here's the, what we have now, we have a captive market, you cannot export LNG. Uh, you can see what the difference is between uh, uh, the German import prices and uh, uh, Japan at uh, whatever they're at there, $17 a million BTUs versus our three, four dollars a million BTUs. That's a pretty unstable market. There's going to be some arbitrage on that market. You're either going to export the gas or you're going to import the industry that's going to use the gas both have happened. We're also in a situation, you could always get the price of uh, oil or get the price of gas either way 
you can multiply the price of gas by seven and get the price of oil. Traditionally, that's the energy equivalent. There's about 5.9 uh, million B, uh, MCF in a, a barrel of oil, so, uh, and it's not quite as handy, so about $7 is a pretty typical number, seven times. Well, seven times four is not $100 a barrel. Uh, and so this is just as unstable. You're going to have substitution of gas for liquids. When you talk about trucks and things like that, it's going to happen. These things have to stabilize, and so you're going to get this arbitrage. It's going to take some time. And then you, you guys have seen this. This is the future price of what we get up in the Appalachians versus Henry Hub. And uh, it used to be you got a plus because you're where market was. Now you get a minus because they don't want it. And it's even worse if you look at spot prices. So this is last night. Uh, let's see, Henry Hub's right here at 457. Uh, Marcellus is at 274. Uh, it's really, uh, 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 really an issue. Um, so what have they done? They still can make some money. You can see what the typical production per rig used to be about a half a million IP. We now have that up to about six million. That's an average per rig. The rigs have gotten better. They can drill faster. Uh, the rigs, uh, you often drill eight wells, 16 wells off a single pad. The rigs actually walk the 10 meters to the next well to the 10 well. You don't have to take them apart. They just walk along and drill the wells. And they drill them in a matter of days. So you're, you can see the rig count's gone down, and that's why you don't look at rig count, but the production per well, per rig, has gone way up. Okay, short term. This is what uh, we're talking about. This is uh, last winter. Uh, storage in the Northeast just about went dry. When you start to get down there, deliverability is not going to get very. Uh, uh, those storage fields cannot, uh, those storage fields produced by compression and pressure, they're old abandoned fields, and as they get lower and lower storage amounts, they, it's harder and harder to get the gas out. They're not salt domes. We don't have enough, uh, we, there are salt dome peakers, but these, uh, most of them are in the traditional oil and gas uh, storage fields. Th uh, that's one of the problems. We just about went dry. But another problem is we got to get this back up to here this summer, and that is probably the fastest rate of storage injection ever. And if we don't get back up to here, you're going to see the price of gas go way, way up this winter. And especially if we have a warm summer and you guys start using it all summer, it's going to be a real problem. And uh, so far we've been pretty lucky. It hasn't gotten warm real quick. Uh, so that's one issue on the short term. And this just shows all those storage units. The, the, the system isn't capable, isn't designed to meet that peak demand by the, the residential and commercial customers during the winter. So they have the storage to bring it up and to store it. And probably, uh, and given the fact that we're using more and more gas, and you guys are all using more and more gas, that storage is probably not sufficient to meet that peak winter demand. So there's going to have to be some more storage. Uh, this just shows uh, futures prices. I just pulled a Rusty Brazel's uh, site. Uh, interesting thing through time that the uh, you've seen this is the uh, 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 the um, uh, futures prices have gone down through time. Uh, also, the seasonality has gone down through time. The difference between the high and low uh, has gone down. On the red one, which is uh, 2014, the one we're dealing is a little something there, he calls it the polar molar. The futures prices are not going down, uh, are, are out of whack, and you, then we go back down to the typical curve because, again, the, the storage is empty and we need to get it full. So there could be some fairly high prices this winter if it's cold winter. Uh, I heard this, I just pulled a few of them off. Everybody's building pipelines everywhere. Uh, and then here's that Rex pipeline that they're reversing the flow back this way from the Marcellus. So changing the flow dynamics of that. And then taking it down to the Gulf, 
uh, taking it down and over to Florida, and there's uh, pipelines that were mentioned going down to uh, uh, the Carolinas being built. Um, everybody's building these pipelines. Uh, part of it is the increased gas demand. You can see this, uh, especially in Florida, huge increase in demand, and uh, most of that being from utilities. Also, the other way to arbitrage that is to go through the uh, uh, various stages of bringing in industry. You're seeing the phase one is you guys, as the gas power, uh, now the downstream products are coming. And one of those are the liquids. Liquids are a, a very valuable commodity. I always look around the room and you think just about everything in this room is made out of some petrol natural gas liquid. If it's not the wood, I guess this is wood, I think it is, uh, it's probably uh, made out of plastics and, and synthetics of various sorts. Uh, so these are uh, the inputs to those systems. The natural gasoline now is a very valuable product that's all shipped to Canada to dilute the uh, um, oil sands to bring it back to the United States. So uh, that's another product that's being uh, used. Um, some real issues on these, uh, again, price of ethane's collapsed because we cannot use that ethane. We don't have enough chemical industry to use it at the moment. Um, cost to produce one metric ton, huge advantage for the United States over anybody else in the world except for the Middle East uh, in terms of uh, making ethylene, which is the basis for uh, all the plastics and synthetics. Um, lots of new projects for gas processing. This is one company, 23 projects from Mark West, as far as gas processing to pull out the liquids to, to make the gas for pipeline specs. And actually, I just pulled out of your own gas journal the number of new plants for gas processing. And each one of these plants is probably $40 million, $50 million being, that have been, been built or are being built in the Appalachian Basin. And you can see that that's gone up to processing of 8 BCF per day of gas, and the number of plants are up to about 41. So a huge amount of uh, infrastructure going on. And then new pipelines, not just to move the gas, but to move the liquids. And these liquids are being moved to the Gulf Coast, where all our chemical facilities are located. We'd love to build some up in here, but try to permit a large-scale chemical facility and see how long it takes you. Uh, I know Shell's been trying it for a number of years. And uh, there's another one uh, on the uh, Ohio that's in, in the permitting. But uh, we do have the infrastructure down here and also the exporting infrastructure. And people are talking about exporting ethane. And uh, they do export uh, propane and ethane. Uh, actually, propane being exported through the East Coast to, to Europe. Uh, industrial Renaissance, here a little bit. I saw a, pulled a couple of them out of Louisiana. Uh, one, Nucor, had a steel plant in Louisiana. They took it apart, moved it to Trinidad and Tobago, cheap gas. They took it back apart and moved it back to the Louisiana. So they are making direct reduction steel in uh, Louisiana. And that's a $750 million project. Sassoil, as this announced, a $21 billion project. That's a hell of a project. Uh, employs 7,000 workers at peak construction. Uh, they're going to do gas to liquids. OK, $4 an MCF gas. I don't know what it's going to cost them to convert it to liquids. Uh, time, you know, six MCF and a that's $24 and cost them four, maybe four or five dollars. They're going to do the arbitrage to the 100 barrel oil. So uh, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think, uh, uh, but uh, okay. Well, that was sort of my view. I had to put a picture of the Marcellus in here. This is the Marcellus. This is what produces. You fracture stimulate that to get your sand in there to get your Darcy flow, but we're also dealing with flow here that is a diffusion flow, flow Fickian type flow. This is 400 nanometers. These pores are on the 10 to 20 nanometer range. 
So this is, uh, the skill has been to produce things that we used to produce out of a traditional reservoir where we're dealing with millimeters and, and microns maybe, and now we're down into the nanometer range that is a, a reservoir. And uh, uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, also put this, this is, you uh, visit this, uh, uh, there's lots of Marcellus seeps. This is the Marcellus right here. This is the Eternal Flame Falls, and it's quite a pretty place, but uh, if the gas flare goes off, someone goes in and lights it again, but uh, uh, the Marcellus, there's plenty of gas leaking to the surface. So, oh, we'll get back. <laughs> Well, I'm a believer in natural selection, but then I saw that, and it obviously is not true. Uh, so, he, and he's in flip-flops, of all things. <laughs> if you notice, he's got flip-flops on. I guess they're Kivas or something. Okay, so, I, I think uh, uh, interesting to see what the price of natural gas is winter. In the medium term, I think everything's showing that natural gas prices are going to be pretty stable over the uh, next five, six years. But I just don't see how either natural gas prices in the United States can stay this way or, conversely, if we can get it over, natural gas prices in the rest of the world can come down, which is what I think will happen to a more reasonable level. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also, I think we're cruising for oil prices coming down, which is probably not, except for personal driving and stuff would be concerned. But uh, I think uh, natural gas prices, are, uh, oil prices are probably also going to come down just because of this arbitrage between the, the two uh, fuels. So uh, with that, thank you very much. And it's not often a rock gets on the cover of Time magazine, so I had to put that out there too. Somebody put their hand up even before you start asking yeah. whether anyone had any questions. So, yeah. Well, I, uh, my name is Gene Unger. I got a small consulting firm, been with uh, Lion Energy for 38 years. Um, I live in Wisconsin, and they're issuing permits for frac sand mining. Uh -huh. it's, and uh, I know a lot of people visit or tour Wisconsin. They're, they're wanting to scrape Wisconsin right down to sea level and take all the frac sand out. We've talked about everything that happens, you know, the slick water and everything. What happens if the frac sand runs out? Uh, well, or it's, or it's I, you know. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I went to the University of Wisconsin, so, uh, and my, uh, uh, my brother-in-law lives in Menominee, which is probably the heart of uh, uh, frac sand. And he, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, he goes out and curses the trucks going by, because uh, he's, a, he's a greeny kind of guy, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, we're not going to run out of sand. There's a hell of a lot of sand, okay? And uh, 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 I think uh, uh, and, and it's an interesting problem. Uh, you know, the bluffs are nice, but a farmer has a bluff with trees on it, and all of a sudden it gets made into a field. He's a pretty happy camper, and you got paid a whole lot of money, too, for the sand. Uh, there's plenty of sand. I don't think there's any problem with running out of sand. And it's not just Wisconsin. Uh, there's frac sand being uh, mined in the Oriskany and in, in, in the Appalachians and stuff like that. And Wisconsin's not the, the only source of sand. Uh, there's, there's, I don't think that's an issue. Uh, uh, it, it's all been, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very old Cambrian sand, 600 million year old sand. It's been well cleaned. It's all the uniform size, so it's easy to sieve. And so that's the reason that, that that's a primo sand uh, for uh, frac sand and uh, um, for propant. Um, um, if we, it, it's cheap. And if the price went up, uh, many people are now using uh, uh, ceramic beads. And, uh, uh, what you can do with ceramics and, and artificial sands is you can coat them with things that make, when you, and you want to make your sand float in your water, and they actually make things that make it expand, and then when the temperature gets, you know, the, the, the fluffs on the side, so it makes them all fluffy and, and light surface area, and, and then it, when they get the temperature down, it, it goes away, and, uh, you know, and, and, and then the propens there, so you can, 
you can place it easier. Um, um, yeah, there's, it, it's been a big, big disruption. Uh, you know, the sand up in Wisconsin. Guar farmers in India were unable to produce the guar. That's what you, but you use to thicken the water. We use it in ketchup. That's why Heinz ketchup takes so long to flow and things like that, and ice cream. Uh, but the guar farmers were all of a sudden unable to produce guar, enough guar for the world, because it's again used in the frack. So yeah, it is disruptive, but I don't think it's going to be, uh, I really don't think it's an issue. Got a question here. Yeah. Some, a question that I can't answer are senior executives who typically are, you know, came up through the power, saw the business say, okay, years ago we didn't have any of this shale, and you told us that we were, you know, in 2002 we were running out of natural gas. Now we have all this natural gas, but when you look at the shale map, like, is there more? Is there a potential for more? Have we, you know, we've talked about we've made it into a manufacturing process and not EMP anymore, but is that, that's kind of my, the question, like what we see on the map now, which is covered, but is there even more out there potentially? <laughs> there can't be, there, there's a whole hell of a lot. I mean, uh, you know, I was just talking about the Utica, the Utica, it's being drilled over in, in mainly in, in Ohio, uh, Noble County, over just east of Columbus, uh, and for the liquids. But now people are thinking it, it goes right underneath the Marcellus, and they were, and we know it's dry gas over there. But the the, the size of the of the Utica wells are so big, no one thought they would be that big. Uh, you know, 40 million a day well, and you drill eight off one pad, you could put one of your plants there and we could supply it off one pad. Uh, for, and, uh, uh, you know, so, it, it, yes, there's more out there. Uh, uh, Eagle Ford is a classic example, too. Uh, Eagle Ford, if you ever looked at where all the wells go, they end right on the Rio Grande. That basin goes way into Mexico. Uh, that's there. Uh, uh, people are drilling out in Nevada now. Uh, Noble Energy is looking at Nevada. Uh, the, the Chainman Shale, sort of the same age as the Marcellus uh, and the Varnett. Uh, they're looking at that, and they're going to be, if they can get the trouble with the Nevada, is you got to deal with the federal government. And if they ever get their permits to do it, uh, they go ahead and do it. Uh, so, yes, there is unbelievable. And then, you know, I have people come from China and say, well, why do you have all the shale gas? And I go, no, the United States doesn't have shale gas. You just haven't exploited it. It's all over the world. Uh, shale's the most abundant rock in the world. And um, I mean, as you mentioned, it is the source for all our traditional reservoirs. It's the kitchen. And we've chased it down the kitchen. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, so this ends our sessions. We'll have panelists uh, after lunch, but for now, I believe the uh, lunch tables are open. Feel free to uh, head on out. <laughs>